thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, thank you very much for coming along here today to hear what, what I and all of the other speakers have to say. I hope you'll find it very interesting and that we can have some, some fruitful discussions as, as the day goes through. And also thank you so much uh, to uh, Etzter Gegen Tierversuche, the organizers um, for, for organizing today. They've, they've done a fabulous job. Um, I, I did wonder about incorporating some German into my talk today. I lived not too far away near Dortmund as a, as a child for a while. I learned German at school, but then I remembered that over 30 years have gone by. So undoubtedly, um, everybody in this room uh, has better English than I do German. So I hope you'll excuse me. Um, so what I'd like to do today specifically is talk about uh, some of the, the wide-ranging work uh, I've done in the last few years, looking at the use of, uh, of non-human primates uh, in neuroscience research. Before I get into the science, I think uh, I should, we should have a, a brief look at the ethical and welfare sides of the issue, because uh, they're important. Um, and one very important point is this. People, uh, the general public, the public of Europe, don't want monkey experiments to be conducted. That's a fact. Uh, now, this is particularly true for experiments that cause monkeys pain and suffering, uh, which arguably neuroscience experiments do particularly. And this has been reflected, for example, uh, even in the European Parliament, who uh, just over 10 years ago agreed that, due to ethical concerns, there should be no invasive research conducted using great apes, which includes chimpanzees and, and orangutans. Um, but they also said that this type of research should also be phased out in monkeys. Now, uh, nearly 12 years have gone by, and this is not happening. And it's obviously something that the public would like to see. So right across Europe, uh, people were asked a very simple question. Do you agree with or object to experiments that cause monkeys pain and suffering? And right across Europe, more than four out of five people said that they did object to that. They didn't want that to be done. Uh, two to three years ago, we had the European Citizens Initiative, uh, in which I was very honored to, to participate, to speak and debate. Uh, and this took place because 1.2 million people right across Europe affirmed their desire to see all animal experiments, not just those involving monkeys, all animal experiments banned. And in the UK uh, specifically, just 16% of people said they supported monkey experiments, even if, for the sake of argument, even if those experiments benefited humans. There is huge objection to experiments on primates. So I think science has a responsibility to listen to the public because the public funds science. They should listen to the public and engage with the public and discuss their opinions and where science should go from here. Now this, unfortunately, really doesn't seem to be happening at all because monkey experiments are still numerous and it, there is evidence that they're actually going up uh, again after a slight decline. So the, the latest figures suggest that over 6,000 monkeys per year are used in the EU uh, in scientific experiments. Now, it's often argued that that doesn't really matter so much because many millions of other animals, of rats and mice and so on, are used. So 6,000 monkeys really isn't a lot. And I think you'd agree that if uh, we had 6,000 monkeys outside, uh, we would realize that that is a lot. And of course, being experimented upon means a lot to each and every one of those 6,000 monkeys. There is evidence that it might be increasing quite dramatically. Uh, from a couple of years ago, there's data suggesting 10,000 procedures took place in one year on monkeys. That doesn't mean 10,000 monkeys, but it probably means more than 6,000. Now, this type of uh, research in which these monkeys are used uh, is, is often specific. It's in testing new drugs. It's in Alzheimer's research, Parkinson's research. But about 600 monkeys, uh, maybe more, maybe up to 1,000 monkeys in any particular year, are used in so-called fundamental basic scientific research. Now, this is uh, to try and 
elucidate basic biology that has no specific obvious application uh, to human medicine. It's basically knowledge for the sake of knowledge. I'm not saying it's useless, um, but it has some speculative application in the future. Now, this encompasses a lot of neuroscience research, which I'm going to talk about now. So what does neuroscience research on monkeys actually involve? Well, uh, it almost exclusively involves uh, rhesus macaques, although, um, and we can talk about this later if you like, there, is, there seems to be a shift towards using marmosets, and that's not for any scientific reason that I can see. A lot of uh, neuroscience research involves a technique called electrophysiology, uh, which is the recording of electrical activity, electrical activity of single neurons or groups of neurons uh, in the brain and the spinal cords uh, of monkeys who are often conscious. And they're conscious because the experiments involve them performing particular tasks. And to perform these tasks, the monkeys have undergone very extensive protracted training regimes. A lot of the research is to shed light on processes such as vision, hearing, uh, movement, and it's funded by the EU with public money or by various charitable organizations, again, with donations from the public. And it is, of course, claimed to be humane by those who do it, by those who fund it. But time and time again, investigations and exposés have shown that it's anything but. Now, these images and a, a few others that I'll show on the next couple of slides, for example, were obtained in an investigation conducted by my colleagues at Cruelty Free International at the prestigious Max Planck Institute in Tübingen in 2014. And I'm, I apologize if some of the images are, are upsetting, but um, I think they're important to, to show you for obvious reasons. So suffering and pain from the procedures themselves uh, are significant and substantial. These often involve craniotomy or removing the top of the skull from the monkey for access to the brain, stereotaxy or absolute complete immobilization of the head uh, to allow experimental procedures to take place. And this is often done by cementing or screwing metal bars into the skull. Uh, and, and now this includes, you have to keep the head very still if you're going to insert electrodes into very specific areas of the brain, sometimes into single cells. But this stereotaxy, this immobilization of the head, uh, can take place for hours on end, every day, week on week, sometimes month on month. It's known to be extremely stressful, I guess no surprise there. And it's indeed absolutely unbearable for some monkeys. They just simply can't stand it. And I think that's understandable too. Some of the procedures involve the use of restraint chairs. You can see a monkey in a restraint chair here. The monkeys uh, are largely immobilized in these chairs. They can't reach up and touch their head or their face, uh, for example. And these chairs are used when the monkeys are being trained to perform particular tasks. So, for example, they'll be watching a computer screen. They'll be uh, trying to, to use a lever or a button when they see or don't see certain things or hear a sound. Now, this training involves restricting or withdrawing fluid and or food. And so monkeys will do whatever it takes when they're extremely thirsty or extremely hungry for a sip of juice or a little bit of food. Again, they sit in these chairs, they have their food and or fluid restricted for hours on end, day after day, sometimes month after month. They put in a very, very long working week. Now, some scientists have suggested that the monkeys cooperate not because they want to, uh, but because they have learned helplessness. If you're in one of these chairs, there's nothing you can do about it. You learn to be helpless. You give in. You comply because there's nothing else you can do, especially if you're thirsty and hungry. And indeed, it's been reported that, quote, the physiology of macaques exposed to repeated chair restraint is similar to people with post-traumatic stress disorder, with PTSD in terms of their, their, the stress levels, uh, the stress hormones in their blood. 
Now, in spite of such severe suffering, the thousands of monkeys used every year continue to be used because the scientists who use them and the people who fund this research claim it is absolutely essential. Without these monkey experiments, we have no hope in understanding how the human brain works and applying this knowledge to disease research, which will result in treatments and cures for those diseases, and so on and so forth. But there is growing evidence that this type of research in monkeys is not essential. It isn't even helpful. It's actually often counterproductive. And that there are better alternatives. There are better scientific as well as humane ways of doing this type of research. That the defense of monkey neuroscience is weak and misleading. And there is compelling evidence that the monkey neuroscience community, uh, in addition, to actually withholding evidence from regulators, for example, of, of how some of the monkeys uh, that they're experimenting with, how, how much they're suffering, how much pain they experience, and contravening international welfare guidelines, that the community deliberately overplays the contribution of monkey experiments to human neuroscience with little or no substantiation of their claims that they exaggerate the human relevance of neuroscience involving monkeys, that they fail to link basic science knowledge from their experiment to actual benefits for humans over and above <coughs> beyond spe simple speculation. At the same time, they play down the contribution of human research to neuroscience, the significance of what it's achieved, the powerful and ever-improving performance of non-invasive methods of research and the scope of what can be done with them. And indeed, invasive research in humans, which I'll get onto in a minute. They underestimate the significance of species differences between monkeys and humans, how they confound this research and the application of data from monkeys to human biology. And they refuse to acknowledge the true degree of suffering involved for the monkeys they use and the impact of the stress and distress monkeys experience in experiments on experimental results. Uh, and I've, I've actually just written uh, my second paper on this particular thing, which is really underappreciated. Now, what all of these things do is together, individually and together, they skew the important harm-benefit balance that's central to any justification of monkey research. I argue, and many more scientists argue, that the harms are much greater than are accepted, that the benefits for humans much less, even non-existent. Now, this was discussed uh, in a paper I wrote with my colleague in 2016, which, if you haven't read it already, I would, I would suggest you do read if, uh, if you're interested in this particular topic, and I'll, I'll show you how to get that at the end. Now, others, even some of those who believe and who have sought to justify monkey experiments in general, have felt compelled to agree with us on this. For example, uh, in the UK in 2011, something called the Bateson Review, which has been criticized for all of the things I mentioned on the last slide, um, underrate, underappreciating the costs to the monkeys in experiments uh, and overestimating the medical benefits for humans. They at least accepted, specifically to neuroscience, that in most cases, little direct evidence was available of actual medical benefit in the form of changes in clinical practice or new treatments. They accepted that in some cases, human research could and should have been done instead of monkey research. They accepted that the actual and potential impacts of vision research using monkeys was low. And they also said that more reviews of monkey research in neuroscience particularly uh, needed to be conducted. Now, not only is this not being done, it's actually being resisted by, for example, the, the Medical Research Council in the UK. They've said they have other priorities. Now, much of this overstating uh, of the contribution of monkeys to neuroscience, the understating of human investigation, 
centers, I think, around two claims. Firstly, you can't do some things to people that you can do to monkeys. And secondly, that techniques most commonly used in human neuroscience, uh, normally but not exclusively non-invasive, aren't powerful enough to tell us what we want to know. Now, I think an honest delve into the literature reveals both of these claims to have only a very, very small amount of truth at best, and that actually what we can do uh, with humans specifically is more than enough. And I'd like to spend a little bit of time illustrating what we can do. So non-invasive techniques uh, are more powerful than ever, more powerful than we could have envisioned 10 or 20 years ago, and they're still improving. We have new ultra-high resolution uh, imaging systems, such as fMRI, with the, the strongest magnets ever available in these machines. And these are providing insights into uh, the structures of the human brain. They're permitting the investigation of neural activity and the functional activity of the brain and of brain regions in humans. They're allowing investigation of the actual neuronal basis of neuroimaging signals themselves, so we can understand better what we're seeing on these images. And this is all being applied to human cognitive research. And this is particularly powerful when you combine imaging experiments with other forms of non-invasive neuroscience. You can see a chap here with electrodes all over his head uh, in a technique called electroencephalography. Um, and when you combine these two, you, uh, you get the high spatial resolution of MRI and the high temporal resolution of electroencephalography. So putting these things together gives you a very, very powerful means of investigating human cognition with a, with a specifically human perspective. And human MRI itself is revealing uh, not only how sensory information is transformed into goal-directed movements. Now, this is, a, this is a big focus of monkey neuroscience. Uh, but something called resting state functional connectivity MRI uh, has successfully identified neural networks that are altered, intrinsic neural networks in the brain that are altered in many disorders, including Alzheimer's disease and schizophrenia. Very, very powerful techniques. Another technique which has been around for a long time is transcranial mag magnetic stimulation, or TNS. And this involves uh, the stimulation with a, a magnetic stick or wand of discrete areas of the brain, again, through the skull, non-invasive. Uh, and it's been informing human brain activity for decades and remains powerful. Human studies have shown how waves of neural activity travel from the brain down the spinal cord measured by epidural electrodes. It facilitates the investigation of movement. Uh, it allows scientists to create temporary virtual brain lesions in specific areas of the brain, which leads us to understand brain function and much more. The point is, so much can be achieved by these non-invasive methods. But admittedly, there are caveats and limitations of non-invasive methods many of which can only be addressed by invasive, in other words, in the skull, into the brain, by invasive approaches. But the point is, a great deal of invasive research is done in human beings. It is not unique and exclusive to monkey experiments, as some have, have tried to suggest. So, for example, electrocorticography uses very small arrays of dozens of electrodes implanted onto the surface of the brain. Now, compared to electroencephalography, the guy with the electrodes all over his head that we saw in the last slide, uh, this provides, as you'd expect, much higher resolution data. It allows exploration of how we plan and execute movements, uh, how we process visual and auditory uh, stimuli, and many, many other things, uh, resolving functional connectivity of different regions of the brain, resolving uh, what, how the brain is responding and connecting with different regions when we're doing various tasks, uh, brain-computer interfacing, in other words, how we can use the brain to control artificial limbs, which you may have seen in the news, and so on and so forth. More invasively still, and still in humans, 
uh, we can implant microelectrodes even deeper into the brain. And this is important. It's not restricted to just the brain surface. And again, this is used in humans. It's often used in people who are undergoing, obviously, brain surgery, maybe for epilepsy or movement disorders. And I think what is um, encouraging and surprising is how many people undergoing brain surgery are keen and happy to be part of this research. They don't just, you know, it's a kind of a, if you're delving around in my head, please do it if this is going to help science and, and other people. People are happy to do this. Now, this has been done for over 60 years, and thousands upon thousands of experiments uh, have been done. Again, it's not just possible in monkeys. And this type of investigation has been used to investigate more localized neural activity, to record the collective activity of small groups of neurons or even individual neurons in the human brain. Um, and applications in humans are many and varied, but uh, they include spatial navigation, various types of memory and how memory works, sensory processing, consciousness, volition, free will, how we recognize faces, uh, how uh, electro -acti electrical activity in neurons oscillates and what that means, what, what the nerves are encoding information, and many, many more. So the, I think it's an obvious question. Uh, human research may be powerful, more powerful than ever, but is there a need for some monkey research? Is there putting ethics to one side? Is there something, are there some things we need to do in monkeys that we can't learn from human experiments? Now, undoubtedly, much of what is done in monkeys is unnecessary. Results are often duplicative of data that's been obtained from other species, often humans, bizarrely, uh, or the work could have been done in people instead. Now, there may be some procedures that can only be conducted uh, in non-humans, perhaps they're highly invasive, perhaps uh, there's a risk of neural damage, and so on. But there are major issues that aren't considered sufficiently, I believe, uh, before any recourse to the use of monkeys in this scenario. In the small number of situations where this might be the case, is it really, really strictly necessary given the astounding range of investigations that we can do from a human perspective. Can the proposed monkey procedure actually significantly inform the area of investigation, given, for example, that monkeys can't respond to the experimenter or comment on their experiences? And this is an important part of human neuroscience. You, you can interact with your experimenter. Uh, Point three, is the specific procedure uh, likely to add to what data could be obtained from human investigation and be absolutely critical to any eventual human benefit? I think that's an important question. We also have to remember that any investigation in animals will be confounded by the use of anesthesia, and this is, this is a fact, and stress. Stress really affects what's, what's going on biologically and isn't accounted for to a, a sufficient degree. And finally, any investigation in monkeys will be confounded by species differences, as the object of the study is not human. And I'd like to, just to start finishing off, briefly touch upon these differences. Now, these are observable differences that have been reported from monkey neuroscience. We know that humans take two to three times longer to process uh, and recognize, for example, visual information uh, than monkeys do. And what that means is that something much more complex is going on in the human brain. If, if it takes two to three times longer, something different is going on that you can't learn from any experiments in monkeys. Discrepancies have been noted in experiments investigating the control of eye movements in gaze between humans and monkeys, which again, this is a big area of neuroscience. It's thought that some types of memory are unique to humans, so you can't even study them in any other species anyway. We know there are differences in types of neuronal oscillations of their electrical activity, notably in working memory and the activity of the hippocampus. Uh, and it's been reported that the timing, thank you, the timing of neural responses and oscillations 
differs between humans and monkeys in general. Something very different is going on in how our brains work, and it's the differences that matter, not the similarities. And there are also major differences in the architecture of various parts of the cortex, the outermost part of the brain, even when we account for differences in brain size. And this is important because functional consequences of these differences involve sensory perception, visceral functions, higher order cognitive functions, emotional and reward related behaviors, all of which are factors in neuroscience involving monkeys. Now it's differences like these, uh, many of which have not yet been noted or discovered, that are due to major genetic differences between humans and monkeys. And again, I, I've written a very comprehensive review of uh, the genetic differences between humans and monkeys and how monkeys can simply never be good models for human beings. So to illustrate, thousands of genes, 15% of 12 and a half thousand genes studied in the brain's cerebellum are expressed differently. It doesn't matter that humans and monkeys share these genes, they're expressed differently and this is what matters. Almost one-third of molecules called microRNAs, now these are small nucleic acids, a bit like our DNA, that actually regulate gene expression. They turn genes on and off and up and down. And they're so important, they are believed to have been the major driving force of brain evolution. They diverge significantly in humans and macaque brains. And dozens of these molecules are actually present in one species and absent in the other. And a type of gene editing, I won't go into what it is, but it's an important uh, part of gene expression. A type of gene editing is, uh, takes place much more prevalently in humans, particularly in the brain. And it is known to affect neuronal functions, neurological diseases, including bipolar disorder, motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and many, many more. These small differences are important. Now, while these differences, uh, are when they're combined with the ethical and animal welfare issues I mentioned, the confounding effects of general anesthesia and the stress of being uh, part of an experiment as a monkey, with things you can do in humans that you can't do in monkeys, such as the study of language, volition, imagery, memory, consciousness, and so on and so forth, with the power of alternative methods that are constantly improving and that are human-specific, I think the case against using monkeys in neuroscience and the case to move completely towards human-specific research is extremely compelling. The last thing I'd like to mention uh, is that I'd be very happy to send you papers relevant to what I've spoken about today if you haven't already seen them. Uh, these are two of the papers on neuroscience and on genetic differences between humans and monkeys. There are more that, that are more informative that, that I've written. I'll be happy to send you. You can get them from our website, cruelty-free-international.org. You can get them on ResearchGate if you, are, if you use ResearchGate or you can email me on my email address and I'd be very happy to send you the papers uh, and or uh, help you in any other way that I can. Thank you so much for your attention and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you.